Hi, I'm Jennifer Isabella. And I'm Srividya Sridharan. Your co-host for Forrester's podcast, What It Means, where we explore the latest market dynamics impacting executives and their customers. Today, we're joined by analyst Rowan Curran to discuss the benefits and risks of synthetic data. Welcome, Rowan. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. So I feel like for this episode, a really great place to start would be defining synthetic data. So can you kick us off there and then maybe we can get into how it originated and go from there? Yeah, absolutely. And so I think, you know, right up here at the front, it's important to disambiguate synthetic data for AI, which is what we're talking about here from synthetic data as a lot of developers have thought of it for you know the past 10 or 15 years we're not talking about you know load testing data we're not talking about performance testing data that you just you know is simple data you generate programmatically what we're talking about here are data sets that mimic the real world and real world conditions but don't actually one-to-one represent uh individuals or um uh you know exact uh exact objects in the real world. So basically uh, what synthetic data does is allow you to have a set of data that you can train off of, that you can test off of, that doesn't uh, have any of the risks associated with personally identifiable information, um, with data sharing issues, or um, you know, it's also a way to get data for scenarios that don't even exist yet for future looking applications. And you know, in terms of sort of how it originated, you know, it's been around for, you know, I think the farthest back papers that I saw on synthetic data were from the mid nineties. Um, but you know, so it goes back quite far and, you know, it started out, um, with simpler things than building whole data sets was all about, you know, just imputing values that might be missing within an existing data set. So basically using statistical models to guess what might be there and then adding that missing data point. But today, you know, synthetic data is really about using more advanced algorithmic methods. Um, a lot of times people use uh, GANs, which are generative adversarial networks, um, which essentially use two models against each other to verify whether a fake piece of data is real by comparing it to an original piece of data and saying, does this match? Yes. Okay. Create that fake piece of data. Um, and, you know, that basically allows you to create, you know, very large data sets from really small sample sizes. Um, but we can kind of get into the different types of synthetic data as we go through. Yeah. And Ron, can you also touch upon why is the synthetic data conversation relevant with the AI conversation? You started a little bit about, you know, um, making the distinction between synthetic data for developers and testing. Why is synthetic data risen to the top as a as a key um, trend in the AI conversation today? Yeah, I mean, I think it really comes down to this perennial problem that we've been talking about for years and decades, and that is that there's just not enough data of the right type, of the right quality to infer and to predict the things that we want to predict. And increasingly, and as more and more applications are, uh, you know, supported or driven by machine learning models, and they are uh, basically being built into these broader AI systems, there's more data that's needed to create this baseline functionality within these uh, applications. So we got to get that data from somewhere. So synthetic data is a really great way to get that data when there's not other options available. So, you know, some of the other options that people have approached are things like uh, pseudo anonymization or uh, format preserving encryption, where basically you take a data set of say customers, and then it turns it into an encrypted data set that you can run analyses on, um, but it won't reveal any of the users, but then, but the actual scores from the analysis will be useful in production. Uh, Synthetic data uh, avoids some of the issues that you can encounter with format preserving encryption and some of these other anonymization routes by not representing real data. So, or by representing real data with fake users. So essentially with uh, things that are anonymized or just use format preserving encryption, there is the possibility, though this is, you know, not that common. There is a possibility to have uh, inference attacks on the model itself, um, where basically you feed it a piece of data, and then the response you get back allows you to determine what one of the original data points driving that model was. And with synthetic data, because all of the original data points are not real, you can never do an inference attack back to a real world user. Um, So really, it's, you know, it's one piece in this broader picture of how to get Uh, data for AI, and it solves some of the problems that some of these other approaches um, uh, can't solve for. 
So clearly, there's nothing fake about synthetic data, but um, you know, it sounds like synthetic data is making AI more accessible to companies uh, who essentially um, have challenges with either good quality data or you know they've just they just don't have enough good training data for the use cases that they're going after. Yeah, and I think that you know the the distinction between synthetic and fake is really important. And so a way that people could think about this is when we say synthetic, don't think about like synthetic, like, you know, polyesters and think about that. Think about synthetic, like synthesize. So when we're creating synthetic data sets, we are synthesizing existing data into a different form so that we can then use it for analyses. So, um, you know, a good example of this is in the healthcare space um, where, you know, you might have, you know, a, a patient data set that is, you know, 100 patients and you need, say, you know, 10,000 patients to run your model off of. You could use synthetic data to turn that uh, data set of 100 patients into a data set of 10,000 patients that looks statistically uh, almost identical to the original data set, but doesn't have any of the original users and also has the capacity to have um, analysis run across it that you couldn't run with that uh, much smaller data set. So where are those data sets coming from? Mm -hmm. So they either start, um, you know, with what I just talked about, where you have a small data set that you then extrapolate and make larger. Um, you can also uh, use synthetic data to um, take, say, smaller uh cuts of your data set. So say, um, for another healthcare example, say you have a disease that only occurs, you know, uh, once in every million uh, people, you know, the statistical data around that's going to be pretty limited. And you're only going to have a few cases of that. But if you use synthetic data to multiply those cases and make them larger, um, then you can run analyses on it. So you're starting with real world data um, in this scenario, and then basically making it larger and more usable. Now, there's a couple of different ways to get synthetic data on top of that. Um, there are folks uh, like a lot of the uh, uh, computer vision vendors who provide synthetic data. They basically provide a platform for you to define what type of data you want and then you know, generate it on the fly. Um, so an example of this is, say, you're doing uh, some kind of uh, human in a scene um, computer vision model and you need to you know generate uh, you need to like look at a model of say a park for whether people are you know going into the park after hours or something like that a synthetic data generator would allow you to basically take a 3d person and drop it into a 3d scene of that park and then uh, put in some uh, uh, parameters around, you know, the characteristics of all the different people you wanted to see there to run your computer vision model off of, you know, height, age, body type, all that type of stuff. Um, and then basically you're creating a data set of folks that are is large enough to run your model on. And then you can deploy that model um, to do that person detection in the park without having to train it on the fly. So the synthetic data basically allows you to build for scenarios that you haven't yet collected data for, or that uh, data just is not yet available um, to collect. So there's variety here. There, it sounds like you know there's image data, video data. You know, can you just talk a little bit about the different types of synthetic data that could be generated? Yeah, absolutely. So you know the biggest places that I'm seeing synthetic data, um, you know, be applicable in a horizontal way is in the computer vision space today. And this, uh, it plays very heavily into, you know, the 3D worlds that I was just kind of talking about. So, you know, you have folks um, like uh, uh, Unity, Unreal, these gaming engines that can build very sophisticated 3D worlds that you know, uh, computer vision models can actually use to train off of. And then you have folks like NVIDIA with their uh, Omniverse products, which is essentially a higher end um, enterprise version of that to basically create these uh, 3D uh, fully simulated worlds that you can then put your, you know, physical products into test models um, within these environments. So there's that kind of 3D data. Then there's also 2D visual data. Um, so a good example of this is a healthcare provider that wanted to um, have a better model for identifying early stage uh or so basically precancerous uh, lung tumors, and they didn't have a large data set of you know healthy lungs with these precancerous tumors because they're hard to detect. And what they were trying to do was detect them earlier. So basically, they took a bunch of healthy lung uh, radio imagery and uh, ap applied a statistical method for how they knew tumors would arise, and basically ran that across the healthy lungs and created a new data set that was based on the healthy lungs with the synthetic data 
augmenting it, so those those uh, cancerous growths, and then they were able to um, build their model on top of that. And then, you know, so those are the, the visual pieces. And then we also see synthetic data uh, being used uh, in tabular formats. So, um, you know, this can be really useful in the healthcare space for uh, things like drug research, uh, um, uh, other types of epidemiological uh, research and vaccine identification and things like that, because it, Currently, it's very hard to share patient data between different organizations. There's lots of issues around personally identifiable information. You know, some institutions just don't want to share data. Getting memorandum of understanding for these things can be a real pain. And one of the advantages of synthetic data is that it basically removes a lot of the governance concerns that many people have when they're trying to leverage their data with partners and with third parties. Um, so I think, you know, synthetic data really helps us realize some of these promises of the data commercialization um, that we were hoping to see um, in years past, but it really had no uh, effective method for getting all the data to everybody in a super secure way. Um, so I think that's one of the really exciting future um, applications of this as more and more people adopt. And definitely that is one of the strong impetuses for folks, particularly in healthcare and financial services, um, to start using synthetic data. So that's clearly a, one of the benefits, right, of using synthetic data, this, you know, less privacy risk and less PII floating around in the world. Um, talk to us a, a little bit more about other benefits that, um, you know, come with using synthetic data. Yeah. So one of the other big benefits that I found through my research, um, and actually I'm just going to also point out that uh, I did not conduct this research on my own. I was with my colleague, uh, Jeremy Vale, who will also be uh, presenting on this topic with me um, at our forum in December. Um, and uh, he's really been sort of hammering on the synthetic data uh, line um, before we even really got into this research. But, you know, what we found in our research was that people were using it for all of this, you know, model training and whatnot. But then Additionally, people are using it particularly at, you know, uh, service providers, whether, you know, it's internal consultants or external um, systems integrators. They're using synthetic data to basically train a machine learning model in their applications so that it's good enough to do a basic prediction so that you can build a prototype of whatever application you need to build, but you don't actually have enough data to do a real prediction. So basically, you know, you might eventually need like a data set that is, you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of data points, but you can create a very small synthetic data set um, to just get, you know, um, some testing data so you can build your application. So, you know, to use a real world example of this, um, Humana, um, the healthcare company, basically uh, you can go to uh, their website. They have a developer portal where you can generate a hundred synthetic patients um, just by making an API request. So, uh, you know, if you're building a healthcare application that needs to kind of understand um, how different people would flow through, depending upon different decisions, you might not have access to a lot of patient data, particularly if you're a startup or if, you know, you're coming to it from a different uh, industry. This is where synthetic data can really help to accelerate development and research progress by democratizing that data um, without exposing people um, to risks through it. And Rowan, um, you know, the conversation with AI, you know, is is not complete when if we don't talk about bias and data. So mm -hmm. maybe can you connect the two and uh, tell us about how synthetic data reduces, um, mitigates, or increases um, bias potentially? Yeah. So one of the funny things that um, I saw in some of the marketing around synthetic data in this research was that people were talking about how synthetic data would be able to remove bias from your modeling. And I think that that is a, uh, as a misguided statement to make, um, because while what I think synthetic data really allows you to do is not, you know, totally remove the biases from your data or say, okay, we can just run this, you know, totally clean model. What it allows you to do is have a better understanding of what the biases in your data might be and to correct or mitigate them when you're doing your modeling. So it's not so much that it can remove the bias. It, it just adds uh, both more transparency to whatever those biases might be and allows you to make some adjustments to those data sets um, so that they may not be biased in one direction uh, or another. I will say that, you know, the this uh, the bias data question can be a bit of a 
maybe a caveat around some of the possible issues um, with synthetic data, because if, if you're trying to basically build a, you know, a perfect pristine synthetic data set um, that, you know, looks exactly the way you want it, that may not be the way the data set is going to look in the real world. And it so then it may not be actually representative of the circumstance um, that is actually in place. So I think it's important to understand that removing Removing bias from how we make decisions does not necessarily mean that the data that we are collecting is unbalanced in some way just because of a consequence of whatever systems led to that data being collected. Are there instances where synthetic data is really not necessary or, or you know, probably companies shouldn't be using synthetic data? Are there any use cases maybe you can think of where it's really not useful to go down that route? Well, I would say use cases where uh, the data that's being generated has to have a lot of human backed nuance in it, um, that can be pretty challenging. So, you know, I wouldn't recommend that you use synthetic data as it exists today to say generate, you know, uh, let's say 100 policy documents uh, for your organization to analyze, you know, uh, what particular, uh, you know, uh, uh, legal actions you should be taking like in the next quarter or something like that. I, because that data is not predictable. It's much more free form. It's much more open. So it's, it's harder to actually get an algorithmic understanding of what the initial data set is to, in order to build a synthetic data set on top of it. So I would say that, you know, the, the use cases that this is best for today are ones where it's like a pretty cut and dry, clear set of what data you're going to need and what that data means. So, for example, you wouldn't, uh, you could use synthetic data to say, uh, um, you know, create a, a, a set of possible, um, you know, garments um, uh, for a, a fashion line, but you couldn't use synthetic data to say, create a set of fashionable garments for a fashion line, because there's no, I mean, you could do a bunch of rules and like add in all this probability and whatnot, but there's no way to tell a machine this is fashionable, create something else that is fashionable. I mean, again, this is starting to get a little muddy because now you have wonderful things like uh, the AI image generators where you can articulate intangibles to a machine and try and have it generate content. But I would say that that is not a particularly viable use case for synthetic data today. But, you know, one of the reasons I'm talking about it in this way is because the space is moving so quickly in and of itself, and it's being driven additionally by these outside factors. So I think, you know, a lot of the large language models and their ability to generate uh, natural language text, that might lead to a lot more use cases for synthetic data in uh, text analytics and natural language processing, um, because you'll be able to generate it more easily. Are there cost implications that companies should be aware of for synthetic data? Because the Humana example that you just use, like if I'm saying, hey, you know, you're plug in my plug into my API and give me some some synthetic data. How does this work? So it, it depends, right? So the example that I gave with Humana, like that, I believe that, that for 100 users, like 100 100 patients, it, that's free. Um, and then there are some uh, open source uh, synthetic data generators out there. Um, but what I see most, or I see it in a couple different ways, right? So for the computer vision space, there are existing vendors that have platforms to basically define like the cohorts that you want for human in seen uh, uh, synthetic data. So like I was talking about before with the, the various demographic like sliders and whatnot that you can use there. So the healthcare data for folks, the cost implication is more around how much does it cost for them to govern the data? And then what is the cost around sharing it and the opportunity cost that might be missed by not levering, leveraging this data with their other third parties? Um, there is also an additional potential cost for folks that use synthetic data as a way to replace really uh, ludicrous real-world data collection scenarios. So um, I I use this example a lot, so it might be you know belabored beyond belief. But one of my favorite uh, instances of this is basically onboard driver management systems. So basically, these are emerging systems that are being required by regular 
regulatory um, statute in uh, Europe and probably soon in the U.S. that basically look at whether a driver is paying attention um, and whether they are, you know, actively engaged with the road and will do something um, if they're not engaged, like ping them or nudge them or whatever. And in order to train these things, you need to like see what people look like when they are tired and driving. And the way that you could do that before was to hire a bunch of human actors and tell them or pay them to like not sleep for a few days or to just act like they were tired and then film them driving in the car and then use that as the basic data set for your model. That's like, that's quote unquote real data, right? Like those are real people. That's a real scenario. You're collecting the data, but it's not like actually a true representation of what that data would be in a real world scenario. So, and so you can use synthetic data to get a better data set there. And also it is tremendously expensive to get that whole manual data collection done with the actors. And also you can't iterate on it. If you need to make like tweaks, you're like, Oh, I wish we had, you know, actor C, but with, you know, uh, dark tinted glasses instead of light tinted glasses. Um, you can't do that if you've collected real manual data, but if you've, you know, created a synthetic data set, you can easily tweak that, um, and, uh, run the model again. So there's a couple different cost implications, both in, you know, how they're collecting the data today for these models. What are the potential, you know, uh, uh, governance and control concerns on the data? And then what is the opportunity cost for not being able to, um, share and leverage this data with your partners and, um, with other parts of the organization? So this is fascinating. <clears throat> Clearly, you know, a lot of opportunity uh, upside uh, with, you know, an eye towards some of the cautionary things that you mentioned, right, in terms of some of the risks involved as well. But what does the future look like of synthetic data? You know, where is this market going? What's sort of your call on um, how synthetic data will will augment and accelerate AI adoption potentially? And then on the supply side, you know, uh, in terms of vendors, providers, you know, what does is, what is the outlook look like there? Yeah, so I am very enthusiastic about the potential for synthetic data to continue to accelerate a lot of these AI applications and AI projects overall. Um, I think that, you know, the question of how to solve uh, the data gap for AI is not a silver bullet solution. You know, there's going to be some additional practices and processes along with synthetic data that include like auto labeling and, you know, um, one shot learning and no shot learning and stuff like that. But, uh, synthetic data, I think is going to get more and more useful, uh, over the next several years, particularly as more organizations realize that it's even available and possible the tools to create synthetic data, particularly for a lot of the, um, you know, uh, quote unquote, in the real world scenarios by using the, uh, the, the 3D uh, generators like Unity and Unreal, um, those are going to create a, a huge variety of use cases for folks. Because imagine if you are designing a physical product that has some kind of intelligence within it, you want to see how that performs in the real world. Previously, you would have to, you know, build a prototype put the software and hardware into it and then like have it, you know, run in a focus group or whatever. Now you might be able to build that into your 3d world, test it out there, run a thousand different iterations and see which one works the best. And, you know, it, I think it's uh, feeding into more of this tabular data and more of the structured data discussion as well, because especially I think as healthcare companies start to get their first taste of what they can do with research um, and financial services companies um, with research with synthetic data, that's going to lead to a really virtuous cycle um, and a reinforcement cycle uh, where th there's more and more demand for larger data sets um, that can really only be supported uh, from the synthetic data side. Um, and then I'll just add one more piece onto this, and that's the my excitement about large language models driving the potential for synthetic data for um, unstructured text. I think that that is a, a big opportunity um, for the space over the next couple of years. Um, but really broadly, I think that synthetic data is going to be one of the key factors in closing the um, the data gap in AI. And I will say that, you know, the attention in this space has been quite strong. Um, so at the end of our research, um, I basically uh, went back through um, with, uh, with Jeremy and we looked at the investment into uh, the synthetic data vendors. And we saw that even just in the few vendors that we had looked at, and we'd only looked at, you know, maybe 
40 or 50 of the top ones, and there's many more, there was half a billion dollars of investment there. And um, that was not even including uh, the investments that some of the much larger companies and the hyperscalers that ha have made into this. So the market, I think, is, is quite big and growing, and I expect this to be a market that continues to be a distinct market on its own, whatever form that takes, whether it's synthetic data platforms, synthetic data providers that, you know, work off of a platform they've built themselves, or whether it's, you know, synthetic data marketplaces emerging. I think that this is going to be a longer term part of the AI story and not necessarily get subsumed into the broader AI lifecycle, like some of these other things that have come up in the past couple of years, like um, model ops and whatnot, where it was like, okay, this is going to be a whole new category, a whole new market, but now it's basically just part of the core. Uh, AI lifecycle. Um, and I don't really see synthetic data getting to that same point because there's such variety, both in terms of what the synthetic data is and how it can be used. So things are getting real with synthetic data. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much for joining us. Great. Right. Thank you so much. This has been really great. If you like what you heard today, be sure to check out our upcoming Data Strategy and Insights event taking place December 6th and 7th in Austin and online. For more details, visit for.com slash DSI22. That's F-O-R-R dot com slash DSI22. Thanks for listening.